Praise you, Lord God. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray for a special endowment of power from upon high. That I cannot preach without the anointing. I cannot minister to the needs of your people without the anointing. Though the anointing breaks the yoke. Let me present Jesus and Jesus only. And let your words come through these lips and to set the captives free. I pray for revelation knowledge and spiritual truths. I rebuke Satan and bind any obscuring spirits that would hide to block the word of God. And I command the deaf ears and the blind eyes to be opened up to the word of God in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. You know, in 1 Corinthians 16.22, the New Testament or the Bible of New Testament Christians had a greeting when they greeted each other, and it was Maranatha. Maranatha. Which means, the Lord cometh. And what we're going to be doing these next few minutes, the next few uh, meetings and so forth, is teaching about end-time prophecies. The Lord was dealing with me about this, and I had a dear brother happen to give me something that verified <laughs> that the Lord wanted us taught. And so here we are. Well, I'm not a scholar. I'll bind you, Satan. In the name of Jesus. So we're going to be teaching about end-time prophecies. We're going to be teaching about the things uh, that the enemy does not want you to know about, that he's tried to blind you from. <clears throat> In Hebrews 1-2, God has in his last days spoken to us by his Son. In Acts 2-17, the Word of God says, And it shall come to pass in these last days, what? The Lord cometh. In 2 Timothy 3-1, it is written, in these last days, perilous times will come. In 1 Timothy 4, 1, in the last days, some will depart from the faith. In 1 John 2, 18, our Lord says, little children, it is the last hour. In 2 Peter 3 and 3, it is written that mockers and scoffers will come in the last days. Oh, praise God. Just before leaving America, there was an article appeared in a scientific magazine, where I read quite a bit, and this was in all the different magazines around throughout the United States, the name of the magazine was Omni, that I happened to get a hold of, but it's, it was telling about where the scientists in America have detected a light beam of power, some of you may have heard this article, read about it, that's beaming towards the earth. And through the technology of today, they have uh, determined that its power is one million billion electrodes of energy. And yet, it's a thousand times the energy that has ever been known to man. It's coming from way out in the universe somewhere. They do not know its source. This is, of course, you know, uh, in various magazines and, and publications and so forth in America that we had to run into over there. In John, chapter 8, verse 12, our Lord Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. My dear people, could this be it? This was just this past uh, April. In John 14, 28, Jesus said, I will come again. I will come again. Now, if you would turn with me, those that have the Bible, to Revelations 21, verse 23. If you can't keep up with me, just uh, write your scriptures down, because I want you to, the word's more important than you turn into the pages, because you can look it up, okay? But in Revelations, chapter 21, verse 23, the Word of God says, and this is in, talking about the new heaven and earth and the new Jerusalem. And the Word of God says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them uh, which are saved, I want to point that out to you, which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. Well, my dear people, you see, the glory of God is so great, so magnificent, that they don't even have it in the heavens in the New Jerusalem. We had no, the Lord doesn't even have any need for the, new, uh, for the sun or the moon because of the glory of the Lord. It's so brilliant. 
In Matthew, verse 24, chapter 24, I'm sorry. Um, it says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, east to west is a long way, isn't it? You can't find the middle. So, my dear people, we are truly in the last days. I'm telling you this from my heart. We are truly in the last days. You're seeing it. All you have to do is turn on your TV. I will show you this. Through the, I'm going to walk you through the Word of God a little bit today. I don't want to put too much on you, but I'm going to walk you a little bit today. And we've got to be aware of what's going on. We must be aware of it because, my dear people, time is very, very short. Very short. Second Peter in chapter 3. Peter here, he's saying this second epistle, or in other words, this second letter, I did use the King James quite a bit, by the way. Beloved, I now write unto you, in both, in other words, both epistles, which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? And then we drop down to verse 8. And the Lord God says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long suffering to usward not willing that any man any should perish but that all no you say all with me all, all should come to repentance but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now, praise you, Jesus. <coughs> Peter, the apostle, was telling us here, first of all, in verse 1, he's saying, I stir up your minds by way of remembrance. In other words, remember what I'm telling you, he's saying. He's saying, remember and be mindful, verse 2, that you be mindful of the words which were spoken of the holy prophets. In other words, the prophets or by prophecy. The prophets. Hallelujah. Please remember that the prophets or prophecy is history that has been foretold. History foretold. Not that God makes things happen. God knows what's going to happen. He knows what we're going to do. Okay. And in verse 3, the, the word of the Lord says, Coming this first, that there shall be come in the last days scoffers mock, walking after their own lusts. I don't think I have to tell you anything about what's going around us, around us, about uh, lusts in the world and so forth and the pleasures and the, the hedonistic society that we live in today. And in verse 8, Peter's saying, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And again in verse 9 he says, the Lord is not slackened concerning his promise, in other words, the promise of what? The second coming, but his long suffering. In other words, he has a lots of patience with us. Praise God. I pray every day for long suffering. I don't want him to come yet. <laughs> We've got too many people to bring into the kingdom, but he's going to. We just pray for long suffering. Willing, in other words, because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why? Because the day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night. What does a thief do? He, come un he comes unaware. He sneaks in. And you're, not, you're not aware that he's coming. He's unaware. And then in verse 10 also, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Can you imagine what Peter must have thought? Now this is written in A.D. 66. What Peter must have thought, elements shall melt. Does that not sound like a nuclear bomb to you people? It does to me. It does to me. Elements shall melt with fervent heat. So he's telling us to be not ignorant 
or a day is as a thousand years. A day is as a thousand years. So what is God uh, trying to tell us? In other words, what does this mean? A day is as a thousand years. Well, God is giving us a glimpse of his plan. First of all, God created the earth in six days and he rested the seventh. According to Bible uh, chronology, according to the Bible chronology, from Adam until Abraham was 2,000 years. That's day one and two. From Abraham to Jesus Christ was 2,000 years. Days three and four. From Jesus Christ until now is days five and six. We are 1,991 years, or a total of 5,991 years. The seventh day is the day of rest, which the Bible talks about. We can turn to it if you like. I will real quick here. Revelation 24 is the thousand year reign or the, the thousand year uh, millennium. <coughs> In Revelation 20, verse uh, 4, I believe it is. Yes, 20, verse 4 and they set up on them and judgment was given unto them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and you're going to say you mean because if I'm a Christian I'm going to get my head cut off no not if you're born again now but if you're born again during the tribulation you're going to and which had not worshipped the beast neither his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. There's your seventh day of your thousand year millennium. Now, all these things that I'm reading to you <coughs> about the, uh, the, the tribulation saints, the, the, uh, the mark of the beast the, on their foreheads, the, the, the thousand year millennium, all these things I will be teaching, you know, but you can only do so much in so much time. Okay. Now, so that is one of the ways that Lord has shown us just like in the days of Noah, you know, God told Noah there's a flood coming, there's a flood coming, and Noah believed him in his heart, and he told him how to build his ark. Now please remember that Noah was out in the middle of a desert, out in the middle of nowhere, and it took him 120 years to build that ark. That ark was bigger than the QE2. It's an enormous thing. Now, and that was sitting in, in the desert. Can you imagine the scoffers and the mockers at Noah? Here's this great big ark, bigger than QE2, sitting in the middle of the desert, and there's no sea within thousands of miles of it. Can you imagine the scoffers and the mockers? But you see that God, Noah knew that he heard from God. Well, my dear people, soon the door is going to close on the church age, as the Bible calls it, just like it closed on Noah's ark, and we're very, very close. To give you an example, I'm going to give you another sign. If you turn with me back to Matthew 24, Jesus was talking to the disciples. They were sitting, beginning in, in chapter 3, they were sitting upon the Mount of Olives, and as Jesus sat there, he said the disciples came up to him and privately, and he's saying, tell us what shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and the end of the world. Now there's actually three questions there. One, tell us when, the, the, uh, when shall these things be. Two, what shall be the sign of thy coming. And three, of the end of the world. Okay. Today we're going to come talk, talk mostly about question number one. Now, I want to go to our Lord Jesus is saying, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, and put of forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass, till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth 
shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the son, the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be caught unaware. Verse 38. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, just like they're doing today, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all, all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now we'll go back to verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. Now first of all, my dear people, the fig tree is a symbol or a representation of the nation of Israel. If you go to Israel, you'll see fig tree leaves on the buildings. If you order a breakfast or dinner, you'll get figs with your dinner. It is a sign just like a, an eagle is a sign in America or the lion is a sign in, in, in Great Britain and so forth. It is a sign of Israel. Now, so likewise, when you shall see these things, I'm sorry, verse 32, now learn a parable of the fig tree when it put its forth its branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. In other words, is talking here about the rebirth of Israel or the restoration of Israel. Now, so likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, know that it is near even at the doors. That's pretty close at the door, isn't it? Okay. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. This generation. What generation is he talking about? But my dear people, Israel was reborn or, or restored May the 14th, 1948. There was no Israel prior to that, all the way back to 608 B.C. And he's saying the, a generation in the Bible is 40 years. And we, my dear people, are the first and only generation to witness the restoration of Israel. <coughs> now you know what's going on around you? Now, <coughs> before I go any further, because I have brought, uh, Carol and I have been out and about, we've brought some new people in to the kingdom of God, and <coughs> I don't want to go too far for some of them, so I want to share some things with you here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, We're going to talk about things of the Spirit. <coughs> but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And what the Word of God is talking about here is the natural man, the natural mind, the mind that is not born again, the man, the man that is not filled with his Holy Spirit does not understand this. He'll never understand it. Why? How many of you know that God is a spirit? Yes. Is God a spirit? Yes. All right. <clears throat> Did God create you? Mm -hmm. Huh? In other words, God created the natural, didn't he? Yes. If God's a spirit, and he created the natural, and we walk around every day in the natural, which is more real? Yes. The spiritual realm. The spiritual realm is more real. More real. If that created us, it's more real. That's why, until you're born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't, you don't understand this Word of God. Why? God is a Spirit. He wrote it through a Spirit-filled man, put it down in this book for a Spirit-filled being to read. That's why people say, I have a hard time reading the Bible. Why am I doing this? I'm going to build a good, firm foundation for the teaching that's coming forth. The Holy Spirit has told me to, to, to lay down a good, firm foundation. What is that foundation? It's the Word of God. It is the Word of God. Now, in 2 Timothy 3.16, Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The word righteousness means right standing. Now, <coughs> 
<coughs> the Lord would have me to tell you or to explain to you that we are to understand that God, in his, in, in his infinite wisdom, directed men chosen by himself to put into writing messages, laws, doctrines, historical facts, and, revelation, and revelations which he wished us to know. All scripture is God-breathed because God himself, through the Holy Spirit, told anointed men of old just what to write. Because you see, the Bible is the word of God. It is the final authority. So how do we know that the Bible is the word of God? Well, there are actually five witnesses in the Bible. One, fulfilled prophecy, which is history foretold. The amazing unity of the Bible. Historical and ar archaeological evidence scientific accuracy, and supernatural influence in people's lives. Oh, thank you, Jesus. First of all, we're going to be studying about fulfilled prophecy and prophecies to come. We're going to be studying about dealing with the nation of Israel, dealing with the Gentile nations, how God has dealt with them. Now, the Gentile, of course, is a non-Jewish person. We're going to be talking about Jesus Christ. To give you an example, when Jesus was put on the cross at, at Calvary, there were 33 Old Testament pro uh, prophecies that were fulfilled at Calvary in exact detail. In exact detail. To give an example, I'll show you one. Uh, if we go back to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, and verse uh, 53, I believe. about our Lord Jesus Christ. This was 712 B.C. This was 712 years before the birth of Christ. The Word of God says, verse 2, 53, verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor com comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, with his stripes we are healed. Sound like Jesus? It is. It was fulfilled on the cross in 33 AD. 700 years before. You see, almost one third of the Bible is prophecy. Almost one third. It's equal in context to the New Testament. There's also an amazing unity in the Bible. The Bible was written over a period of 16 centuries or 1600 years by 40 different men of God, most of them who never met each other. Secondly, the Bible from, generations, or from Genesis to Revelations carries a, uh, what I call a continuous scarlet thread of God's love and his plan for man's salvation. Thirdly, there are many historical and archaeological facts and findings. I have personally read over 112 myself through some books I've got. Uh, examples such as where they have found archaeological findings of the Garden of Eden, the Tower of Babel, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the fall of Jericho, Solomon's gold, Solomon's stable, Solomon's copper, the Tower of Hezekiah, and most recently, Carol and I saw this just before we left, we got a videotape of it, they found Noah's Ark encased in, in, in the uh, ice. Remember that? They got a chunk of the wood off of it and analyzed it. It's 6,000 years old. Well, you may say, well, how come we don't see all that? Because you live, we live in a, in, in a, I can't pronounce that word, hedonistic society of lovers of God. They do not want to bow their knee to the word of God. They do not want to bow their knee to Jesus Christ. It's not hard. It's the best thing they've ever done. And of course we have scientific accuracy. 
But I want to show you real. So I'm going to show you about three or four real quick examples. You can turn to these if you want. First one is in uh, Isaiah 40, chapter 22. He that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. My dear people, the earth was believed to be flat until the days of Columbus and Magellan in the 15th century. And yet, here it is in Isaiah in 712 B.C. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And we as man didn't believe that. We thought it was flat until the 15th century. In the book of Job, verse 26, chapter 26, verse 7, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. And hangeth the earth upon nothing. The earth is suspended in space, is it not? And yet, it was not discovered until 1687 by Sir Isaac Newton. And here it is in the Word of God in 1520 B.C. 3,500 years ago. Thirdly, the book of Leviticus, chapter 17. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And what it's talking about here is facts about the human bloodstream. And yet, it was not discovered on, on, until only a few hundred years ago. And these facts were written in 1500 B.C., 3,500 years ago. And fourthly, I'm going to take you all the way back to the, to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 21. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. That's called the law of hereditary. After your own kind. That was not discovered until 1862 by Louis Pasteur. 6,000 years ago in the Word of God. And fifthly, is, of course, the supernatural effect and power of the Word of God. Amen. Praise God. Praise Multitude upon multiplied upon millions can testify to its transforming power in their lives. Amen. When they step forward and they're born again, they are changed in the twinkling of an eye. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Yes. We've seen cancer healed, alcoholics set free, homosexuals delivered, drug addicts transformed, marriage is healed, and it goes on and on and on. People are set free from all kinds of things through the blood of the Lamb. Why? Because we have overcome Him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Amen. All the power of God in the world couldn't save us. It took the blood of the Lamb. The blood of Jesus Christ, that final sacrifice. Because each one of us that had been born again had been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into a marvelous kingdom of God to our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> My dear people, <clears throat> we are living in the very last of the last days. I'm going to talk about Iraq. You cannot turn on TV without seeing Iraq. You've got 28 nations. You've got... Now Israel's... They're trying to get Israel involved. It goes on and on and on. And everybody's running around in the streets that know a little bit about God and say, Oh my gosh, this is, this is Armageddon. Are they not? Not quite yet. <laughs> 